people often know their personas far less than they think and they document them far in less detail than they should. They don't always have a great idea of the buyer journey where they go on, why things happen. You know, what triggers this persona to say, I'm ready to go solve this problem or I now have this problem and I want to go look for information about it. They don't understand how the, that information is then used or consumed internally to hmm. cross a team. They, they don't necessarily understand um, the decision criteria that the people would use to make a decision. So we see this to be a very common thing, especially in companies that have been around a while. They're just kind of, they, they, they assume a lot of this stuff. We are back with the Cold Star Project, the podcast about the unexpected challenges of scaling businesses. I'm here with Todd Hockenberry again, uh, the owner of Top Line Results, author of uh, the book Inbound Organization. He's all about effective content marketing, inbound marketing, works a lot with uh, industrial manufacturing firms, but that does not mean that what he has to say is not applicable across the board because we've had some great conversations uh, in our previous appearance and, you know, offline where we've been chatting about his experience with car dealerships and uh, other service organizations that could well use his kinds of services. So welcome back, Todd. Jason, thank you for having me back. It's uh, definitely an honor to be back a second time, and I'm looking forward to keep uh, keeping the conversation going. You bet. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, content marketing, inbound marketing. Uh, you put out an article a little while uh, ago. I guess you wrote it a little while ago, and it came out uh, you know, recently, and it's about when content marketing fails. So I wanted to have you on to talk about this topic because – it's like in sales or, or in martial arts or anything, really. Uh, stuff happens so fast. And if you don't recognize what's going on, you're going to get knocked on your butt, right? And so if you just go and put some content marketing out there, the, the, you know, first of all, the, the marketplace just might bypass you. Uh, they might not even notice. Or, or, or uh, you may get some results, but then something weird happens and you're like, wait, what happened? And, and now you're on your butt, just like in the martial arts example. So... Uh, what can you tell us about when content marketing fails? Why does this happen and what does it look like so our viewers, listeners can recognize this situation? Well, what it looks like is pretty obvious, Jason. It's, it's, uh, it's like the old cliche, right? If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Well, if you create an article and content and you publish it and nobody reads it, does it, does it matter? <laughs> no. The answer is no, it doesn't matter. So the, the measure is engagement. And I would say that the, the, the key qualifier of engagement is the right engagement, that it's engagement with your target audience. So that's how you measure the effectiveness of it. And I, I give you a funny example. This was years ago. We used the, we have a client that does, uh, makes fuel additives and they've, they really adopted content marketing about nine years ago and, and taken their blog. Well, they took a blog that didn't exist and now they have over 200,000 people a month on this blog talking about fuel additives, if you can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, we we put a picture in, they were talking about bacteria in fuel. So we had a picture of bacteria. It was publicly sourced. We we gave it proper attribution so we didn't get those crazy spammy letters from somebody saying you stole their picture. And um, we saw this tremendous amount of traffic to this blog post. And we're like, this is awesome. We got all this great traffic. And then when we dug into it, we realized what happened was we had optimized the image so well that the image for bacteria was ranking on the image search. Mm -hmm we were getting was people that were looking for pictures of bacteria. Mm -hmm. so that was, that was nice. It was interesting, but you know what? It didn't help. So right. we just took the picture out, right? It didn't, it wasn't helpful. So um, the point is that you can get traffic and you can get interest and engagement, but is it the right engagement? Um, are you attracting your ideal target audience? That That's the ultimate, ex ultimate of this, right? And you know, I, we do a lot of work with HubSpot and, and, um, they publish tremendous amounts of content and just deep and wide content on just about any topic you can imagine. So hmm. their, their philosophy and lots of other content marketing companies would be in this category where they think of themselves almost as publishers, right? That they're going to pick these topics in this universe of, of information they want to share and they're going to create just gigantic amounts of content and they're going to just create this 
huge level of awareness around their content and bring so many people into their funnel that they can then sort them down to be, get, get kind of marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads and ultimately customers. But they've got a giant top of the funnel awareness amount of content and engagement and on a relatively small, now I don't want to mean small, their numbers are big, right? I think HubSpot's at 60, 70,000 customers, but they've got millions and millions of people that engage with their content. So that's a model that, that works great for them. And that's kind of the classic inbound marketing model, but that's hard to do for most companies that don't have tremendously deep teams of resources or, or endlessly deep budgets to go create amazing large amounts of content. So you've got to be a lot more targeted. So Again, we're always going back to the kind of number one thing that you've got to do, which is you've got to have a strategy, which starts with your ideal persona and your ideal buyer, knowing who they are, what issues they have, how you help them, how you solve their problems, and then creating content around that mm -hmm. and sharing it and optimizing it in the places where they go. And again, this sounds pretty straightforward. We should all know this, but, it, but where we see a lot of content marketing and inbound initiatives failing is that that it's not just good enough just to do it. And mm. people often know their personas far less than they think. Mm. And they document them far in less detail than they should. They don't always have a great idea of the buyer journey where they go on, why things happen. You know, what triggers this persona to say, I'm ready to go solve this problem or I now have this problem and I want to go look for information about it. They don't understand how the, that information is then used or consumed internally to hmm. cross a team. They, they don't necessarily understand um, the decision criteria that the people would use to make a decision. So we see this to be a very common thing, especially in companies that have been around a while. They're just kind of, they, they, they assume a lot of this stuff. Hmm. So they, they don't think enough on the strategy side for content because ultimately, content is strategic. And I made this point in the book, our book, Inbound Organization. It's not just something that the marketing department does anymore. Content has to be a strategic initiative from the top down. Why, you ask? Seems like a strange thing to say, but it, it, it is not if you understand the modern buyer. And if a large percentage of the sales process happens offline, before they talk to your sales team. If a giant percentage, well over 95% of B2B in particular, um, purchases start with an internet search. If those two things are the case, and then ultimately, if the majority of the business goes to the first company that is helpful to searchers and buyers today, if you, if you take those three facts and backed by data, then content becomes that conduit into that process with the current, with modern buyers, with most of us. You start engaging with your uh, potential future uh, companies that you want to buy from using content online, social media, reviews, rankings, ratings, uh, third-party sites. There's all kinds of ways we, we, adopt, uh, we engage with content. So that content becomes your brand. It becomes your message. It becomes your voice for people at the beginning of the process. It also is how you, you communicate to a large extent through the process, whether it's your marketing team uh, working with marketing qualified leads or sales team with sales qualified leads. Um, Again, I, I think the the content piece is is really a piece of your strategy because if your content's clear, if your messaging is clear, if your messaging is helpful, then you've thought it through and you've got a strategy to be helpful and to be clear and to be concise and to be um, extremely connected to that buyer. And um, you know, I've used MQL. I just used that term marketing qualified a couple of times. And what's interesting is that oftentimes the metrics for marketing and sales are different. Marketing may, mm -hmm. marketing may measure engagement on a, a marketing qualified lead based on site visits or blog views, but then sales really cares about people that are ready to buy soon or now or qualified on some level. And I personally think that the connection between the classic inbound marketing generated MQL to connection to what a sales qualified lead is, is weakening and it's getting less connected all the time. Hmm. Uh, I, I just, I think that it's, it's, and we see this where you have a massive amount of MQLs come in and few that really are qualified. And, and the symptoms of this would be if your sales team says, well, these leads aren't any good. 
or we don't, you know, those leads that come in from the marketing guys that we, we don't prioritize those. They're not, they're not qualified or they're, they never turn into anything. And again, we should measure these things and we should have the metrics to say, okay, how many people come into our funnel at the top end and how many people come out on the bottom end? And, and ultimately the ideal thing would be, it's a very, it's not a funnel at all, right? It's very, very, uh, pipe. yeah, it's a pipe because I, I don't even like, that's not a bad, it's better yeah. because the ultimate Straight is line. you're never going to get everybody, right? But right. if your targeting is narrow and you're focused on a persona, yeah. then the only people you're going to bring in the funnel and engage are the people that are, you really want to <clears> talk to. Right. Otherwise, you're bringing in people that aren't necessarily a good fit, and therefore you're you're spending time and you're you're creating content and you're you're uh, um, you're you're kind of expending energy and resources on people that are never going to buy from you, and nor should they buy from you because they're not a good fit. Right. Yeah. So you're always wanting to narrow it down. That starts with clear thinking and clear strategy. Who you want to go after? Why you go? Why they should buy from you? What's the best fit? And then right to that. And um, not necessarily try to be, you know, it'd be like me writing about inbound marketing, right? I, 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 that's not, I mean, I could write about inbound marketing all day long, but hmm. that's not my persona. That's not who I work with. That's not who I want to talk to. I'm going to narrow that down to inbound marketing for manufacturers or industrial inbound marketing or content marketing that works for engineers, things like that, that, that really drive it closer, uh, as close as I can to the ideal buyer that I want to engage. So strategy first, you got to have a strategy and that includes your persona and the buyer journey and, and knowing who you help and why you help them and when you help them. Yeah. And, and like you said, this stuff sounds basic, but it does end up being assumed and getting into kind of an inertial flow of, oh, this is what we do. And especially when you get a changeover of staff in a company over a number of years and the people who were originally there who started this stuff uh, are not there anymore. And the folks who are running the program now are just doing it by rote, basically, right? And nobody's really thinking about it. I've been a copywriter for 25 years. And I'm also very interested in documentation, which sounds like a boring word for people. But, and you'll see, if you look at the videos I've made recently in the podcast episodes, I've been bitching about this, that nobody is writing anything down. So I am echoing everything that you've said. They don't understand their ideal customer. They haven't really gotten strategic. And I could improve on this myself, by the way. I'm not oh, we uh, all could. Ex excused from any of these sins, right? Uh, and, and nothing is written down out there. And so how can you expect to learn when you don't have a feedback loop in place? Like the simple thing that you said, folks should understand uh, this many people need to come into the funnel uh, to get a buyer out the other side. I work with people every day on, on things like this and almost no one has these numbers. It mm -hmm. is, it is crazy. Uh, well, I want to make a comment about yeah. agencies right now. I'm going to, I'm going to take a shot at my inbound agency um, uh, huh. partners or friends. I've been in the inbound agency world for um, almost 10 years. We were something like the 30th partner HubSpot ever had. So we've been around this for a long time. Hmm. And uh, I remember going to the first partner meeting at HubSpot and there was a, it was a, it was a hotel conference room. Right. It was just a, it was just a handful of us. So, so we've been doing this for a while. And what I see is it, it was different when there was a fewer, was a, there were fewer agencies that were really focused on it, really understood it. But now there's thousands and thousands of agencies and just about every agency would say they do something about content marketing or, or um, uh, inbound marketing or something like that. And what I see is that agencies get into the kind of pacing of a routine. Well, we do this many blog posts or we create this many social posts. We do this many eBooks or we're doing these kind of things. And they're not real good at connecting the dots between their, that, those content marketing efforts and actual results. They kind of, they, they lean on vanity metrics, like looking at traffic and they look at uh, downloads. I, I've had websites and I've had clients uh, that have been super successful that have actually got less West tra web traffic. They got fewer requests for quotes. They had fewer leads coming in. That was actually good because it gave them focus and they were, they were much higher quality. So I, I think agencies tend, it's very hard for agencies. I think so. I, I empathize with them. It's hard with the model of having a team cross functional team that's applied to a customer to try to, uh, you have a fee per month or by, by project or over a period of time or however you set it up. And to try to connect that to results and not get stuck in the minutiae and the details of day-to-day -day and week-to-week, 
clients want to see reports. They want to see lists checked, checked off lists. They want to see these things done. And, and it's very easy in that model to lose sight of the results of why you're doing this. Right. And are we really reaching the people we want to reach? And I, I, I know this because I've done that uh, as a business for a while. And I now work with clients as a consultant and work with their agencies. So I see this from their point of view and I see it stepping back a little bit. And I think it's easy to say you talk about results. And, and again, companies can still get great results with inbound marketing and content marketing and they should. But I think it's very easy to get distracted. So I would just warn everybody that, that if, you're, if you're, you're an agency or you're dealing with an agency, make sure you've got some really strong connection to the actual results you want, that you can measure that connection to the persona and the ideal buyer, and that you are being able to drive this back to you know, opening up new engagements and new relationships that can turn into business. Because again, that's the point and uh, the vanity metrics don't matter. Yep. And I, I, cold star, that is a major thing that we do is unravel all this bad measuring that goes on where you've got conflicting metrics between different departments or outsourced agencies like that, that are fighting each other because I mean, you can go back and, and look up the perverse incentives episode of this podcast, right? Where I give examples of horrible incentives through history where people are essentially getting rewarded to do horrible things or stupid things, right? And, and they're all over the place. And if you think they're not in your organization, well, think again, they're there. <laughs> uh, I can think of um, right, right from what we've been talking about. If the, if the measure for the marketing department or the marketing agency are, are vanity metrics, clicks, likes, comments, shares, uh, and, and leads signing up that maybe aren't great quality because they're not filtering properly, right? That is a perverse incentive that is badly impacting the sales department and their performance because they're going to get just a bunch of junk leads in there, right? And as you've said, <clears throat> they will react. <laughs> they, yep. they will react by cordoning those leads off and quarantining them and saying, no, those are awful. We don't deal with those. And, and now, now what? That, that doesn't sound like flow, right? That's, that sounds like damning and, and circumventing. And anytime we see behavior like that at Cold Star, it's time to shine a bright light on it and start digging in and unraveling. What, what would you recommend companies do if they're watching this and going, oh my gosh, I wonder if this is happening at our place. What could they start with to start unraveling this stuff and get things into alignment the way you're talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you two quick stories real quick that'll lead into the answer to that. Um, we work with a, a large um, publication, an international publishing company. Everybody would know their name. I'm not at liberty to tell it. I wish I could. I really <laughs> would love to say their name. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we found that they were creating uh, marketing campaigns that were driving tons of what they called MQLs, right? They were really just getting a lot more engagement, a lot more people in the top of the funnel. And then I sat down with the sales leads and we started to measure it and look at the, look at the quality of those. And something like 70 plus percent of those never got followed up on by the sales team, right? They just never could, mm. they, they couldn't justify the expense. They'd, they'd called enough of them and they were like, well, these aren't good. So we've got these other ones we have to do. So 70% of them weren't being followed up, up on. So, mm. so a huge amount of the effort that marketing was making wasn't being translated into anything that was actionable. So, so the answer to fix that is number one, was to the first thing we did was look at the, the quality of those leads and change the criteria for when they went to sales. Mm -hmm. So we had to rebuild credibility with marketing and creating MQLs that were going over to sales as SQLs. We had to change the criteria to make sure they actually did meet that criteria and then get an agreement between the two groups that if, if we do send these over to you, you promise you'll follow them up and here's <laughs> how you do it. So we had to get alignment and agreement there, right? Yeah. That's the first thing is you've got to get, you've got to get your, your teams aligned and their goals and their definitions and their agreements have to be in place. The other one I want to, I want to say is actually one that I did that I learned a lesson. So like we, I've been doing this for a long time and, and I, we still learn, right? So yeah. <laughs> for, for my business, I wrote um, earlier this year, um, we decided to go after manufacturing marketing as a keyword and a topic. We felt like it fit our, our niche and, so we created some content and we were actually successful at it. We, we saw our ranking go up on a bunch of the associated keywords. We saw a lot more traffic to our site. We saw lots of engagements and I didn't get any business from it. 
right? No, I didn't get any obvious connections to people that searched and looked for that term. And what we found was, and again, this is so obvious to me looking back, um, I should have known this up front, but it, that term attracts marketing people. Ah. It attracts, it attracts students or young people or people that are, um, you know, kind of the classic marketing persona, but that is not who hires top line results. The CEO hires us, the president yeah. hires us. And that person does not search manufacturing marketing, that they don't do that. Hmm. So again, that's, it's just an example of that to me is a misalignment of, of uh, persona and journey, what they're looking for. And I actually started to talk to the CEOs and presidents of companies that I work with. And I asked them and they were, they all said to a person, men and women both said, no, I don't, I would never search that. And I was like, you dummy, why didn't you ask him that before you started uh-huh. to do this, right? <laughs> so that to me is the point, right? That goes back to that strategy piece. So if it's not working, like the example I just gave you, you go back to the beginning and say, what were my assumptions? Right. Why did I do this? Who was I going after? What's my target? I got it wrong. Mm-hmm. So I have to go back and change my assumptions and say, my persona's off. I did, my persona was right, but I got the buyer journey wrong, right? I got the, the, the triggers and the things they look for and how they think wrong. And I got that information by asking them and talking. to them. So, so again, I would always say, um, that's one thing I always look for. It's a very early question I'll ask my clients or prospects. I'll say, is your marketing and sales team surveying your target audience and asking them these questions? Are they, are they getting this feedback directly from your ideal buyers or are you just sitting in a room thinking it? Right. So most companies don't do that. They, most mm-hmm. companies do not ask and, and try to discern that directly right. from talking to customers. So right. again, it's, it, I'm always asking that question that, so I would, I would, if you're, if you're missing it, go back to the beginning, challenge your assumptions get the quanti- qualitative data, not, not like you guys do, Jason, the quantitative data, get the qualitative data from your target audience that says, these are the things we use, and then just continue to narrow that down and can get back to the, the source. So again, alignment of your teams, alignment of everybody internally on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the content and inbound marketing is sp- focused on. And then, and then the analysis, then you, you um, learn, and then you reapply. So that's a pretty standard process, but it's, again, I, the, these basic disciplines, um, you know, people ask me what I do all the time and I say, well, I, I'm a consultant and I do sales and marketing work with B2B companies. And, and, uh, at the end of the day, a lot of it is just this, it's, it's yeah. just saying, these are the things you have to do and being another voice to say outside of their kind of bubble yeah. and saying, guys, you're, you're, you're so in it, you're missing the point. Uh, these things, they know these things. A lot of times they just go, oh yeah, you're right. Um, that's a large part of what I do is just to help make sure people are asking the right questions, challenge their assumptions, and then uh, kind of doing the, these kind of core principle things over and over again and doing really, re- doing really well. That's what still works today. Yeah, and it's amazing how, how much of an echo chamber companies can get in uh, how dependent on features that they run to to sell. And that's not, that's not what your buyer was looking for. Uh, again, having been a copywriter for two decades and a half, uh, every time I've gone into, say, writing a sales letter or something like that for somebody, uh, it's not a big thing I do these days, but for many years it was. If I assumed what that customer valued and wrote the, the letter around that, I would be wrong <laughs> every time because you are not your customer. You have to go and ask them, right? Talk to them, listen to them. What do they value? What do they want? Cause the stuff that they thought was important was not the stuff that I thought it was important ever, ever, like not once <laughs> was there an overlap. So, so what would you recommend <clears throat> or how do you get through that initial part of uh, getting the meeting of the minds, right? Does this come from, getting that president or CEO to hire you and then they, then they kind of grab the two departments and go, come on, you knuckleheads, you know, cause you're, they're bitching about, oh, it's sales and the marketings are like, you know, they're, they're blaming each other, right? But does that have to be imposed from above or is it, as you say, uh, you know, hey guys, in all reasonableness, if you looked at this and that, oh yeah, do they, do they start agreeing with you or is there a bit of a fight? Well, it's, it's usually a little bit of both, Jason. Okay. 
ideally, well, typically what happens with us is it's, it's a revenue issue or there's a, mm. a retention issue where, you know, we lost some clients or, or there was some slippage or changes somewhere along the lines, there's some pressure. So they're okay. saying, okay, we need some help. And, uh, Sometimes it's it's because they want to do something new. Hey, we're doing well. We want to do something different, or we want to, or it's a competitive pressure. Hey, we see our competitors doing these things. We don't want to get behind. So it's typically a reaction to things like that, where we we and that's a CEO reaction, a president leader reaction. Marketing and sales will bring that in if um, they'll bring us in if they feel like they're not being effective on the kind of operational side. That's where that they'll they'll bring us in. But if the if the reality is they both have to be on board. Um, you've got to you've got to get everybody lined up because that's what that's the point, right? It's it's alignment of goals, alignment of of uh, the idea of what we're here for and what we're doing and who we're doing it for. And um, it, it typically is is the leader of the company that that understands or the top leadership that understands there's there's something missing. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily know what it is or they don't necessarily know how to identify it, but um, that's where we usually come in and. The, the in, in some cases it's it's just a matter of we need to get shaken up a little bit right it, we need to we need to get a different perspective and uh, get it, get some different eyes on what we're working on because again we think or or we believe right is the is the thinking that can stop you from putting yourself in their shoes right you put yourself in the customer's shoes you then you say well, I know they say, or they've, they tell us, or we've, we've talked to 50 CEOs and leaders or target, whoever our target is, they have common this, right? Or that. And those are, those are different statements than saying as a salesperson, well, I think, or marketing saying, we believe this is the best place to go. Those are different. And Mm -hmm. the conversations change when you start speaking from that point of view. When you start speaking from the customer's point of view, now all of a sudden, is that blog post I'm writing really for them? Or is it just to check a box and say we had to do one this week? Is this new design of a web page or this new section of a website, is it for them? And oftentimes the answer is hard to connect to that customer. Hmm. That, that would be the thing I would challenge marketing and, and salespeople to do is, is, are these things relevant? Do they matter to your customer? Are they helpful to them? You know, if salespeople are prospecting, do I really need another one of you in my life? Probably not. (laughs) So, okay. So why, from your perspective, would I want to talk to you? So salespeople need to be that interesting and that, that connected to that person to say, you know what, I can make their life better. I can improve their world. So they, they're going to want to talk to me once I get through to them and I show them and I I explain to them how I'm going to help them. They're going to be thrilled that I called them. Right. That should be a salesperson's goal, not just, oh, I did my 100 calls this week or 40 calls today. And again, I still see these things all the time. And it's, it's, uh, it's about getting out of your own head into that target audience's head, that target customer's head, and, and really thinking from their perspective and being a resource and, a, and an asset for them. So when you create that content that you're saying, look, this is super helpful. We know this is going to make a difference for our audience. And we know this is going to be something they're looking for. And, um, and that's why I think video is so important. And I'm not a huge fan of video. I'm not, I, I don't like to be on videos myself, but it's so <laughs> I'm important. doing it right now, Todd. I, I know. I'm not a huge <laughs> fan. But it's so important because it's, so, it's how people want to consume so much content. And um, you know, I look at my kids. They live on YouTube. They're always, everything, they, they, they consume it all via video. Not all of it, but a lot of it via video. And, and um, it, it's, it's, a, it's another dimension, and it's much more interesting oftentimes than the, the written word. But, um, again, I know I resist it, but we, we, we need to think about that from the customer's point of view and the buyer's point of view. What's, what's the way they want to consume this content? What makes it easy for them? And um, th- that's, again, it's, Talking about being customer centric, my goodness, you would think everybody would know this by now, but it, it, we don't. Um, and I, I push back on leaders and marketing and salespeople all the time. And I say, if you consumed your marketing, if you were on the other side of the table from what you're doing, would you like it? Would you find it helpful? Would that answer your questions? And look in your day-to-day life and the marketing and the sales processes people put on you. Are they helpful? Are these, from my perspective, are they simple, right? Um, I say the vast majority that I engage with are not. They mm-hmm. are painful and difficult. And um, 
you know, it's like my, um, um, well, I don't even want to get into like the cable companies. That's too easy or cell phone companies. But, uh, you mentioned my car dealer earlier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this is a great focus persona story. So I'm, I'm dying to have a car dealer client out there. So if any of you are listening, you know, or you are a car dealer, call me. I will, I want to work with you desperately. Uh, I bought a car about five years ago and at the three year mark, something magic happens after three years. They, you start getting phone calls and tax or uh, letters or, or they start reaching out to you and saying, Mr. Hockenberry, you've had your vehicle for three years. We have a very high demand for your model. We'd love you to come in and we'd give you an estimate on, on a trade in because there's a, there's really high demand right now. Right. Okay. I get the first call month later. I get the next one third call, I said, look, guys, I'm buy and hold. I'm the buy and hold persona. I'm telling them exactly who I am. I drove my last car 250,000 miles. I'm not selling it. Okay, thank you. Click. Next month, the call again. Finally said, look, I told you a couple times already, you have a CRM, right? They said, yeah. I said, put a note in there. Don't ever ask me this question again. Don't call me. Quit calling me. Quit sending me emails. I'm not selling the car. If you call me again, I'm never stepping foot in your dealership again. I'll take my service business somewhere else. Okay, great. We made a note. We won't bug you. 30 days later. Hey, Mr. Hockenberry, we'd like to have you come in and give you an estimate on your, okay, guys, I told you. That's it. So I said, I'm never coming back again. I said, I'm going to tell everybody you guys don't listen to your customers. I'm going to give you bad reviews. I'm, I'm telling them all the things we're talking about that <laughs> create content online. Yep. 15 minutes later, the manager calls and she says, sorry, Mr. Hockenberry, really sorry. We, we bothered you. We annoyed you. I'm, I'm making note in here not to call you again. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take you out of our database so we don't bother you anymore. I'm like, well, that's an interesting way to solve the problem. <laughs> take me out of your database. And um, so they're basically going to erase me from their memory. They're, right. not going to he- they're not going to help me. They're not going to think about what I've been telling them. I'm a buy and hold persona, right? right. And, and so I, I switch dealers, go to another dealership. Actually works out better for me because it's closer to my son's school so I can drop him off and go get my car service. So I go in and I sit there and I take my computer. It's a little quiet time while they're working on it. I can write. And a young lady walks over and says, Mr. Hockenberry? I said, yes. She said, you know, we have a really high demand for your vehicles. We'd love to get, get take you over here to the service manager and give you, give you an estimate on your car. I'm like, you guys are kidding me. You're killing me. You all went to the same school mm-hmm. with the same script. Yep. So they keep, now I just, I laugh at it now. I just play along. And they keep doing it. They, they send me letters and they call me. And every time I go in there, it's like this playbook they all run. And not one of them, two different car dealerships, multiple people has ever said, you know, that's interesting, Mr. Hockenberry. You said you're buy and hold. You keep your cars for a long time. What is your goal for that car? What do you want to do with it? I, and I would say, that's a great question. Mm-hmm. Nobody's ever asked me that before. What I want to do is when my daughter graduates from college in two years, I want to give it to her as a gift and I want to keep it in great shape so she can drive it for four or five years and get established in her job but not have to pay for a car. It's like a gift for her. I'm, I'm tending this gift for my daughter. What a great goal. And, and that person could easily say to me something like this, Jason, you know, we got a guy over here, Bob. He's been here for 20 years. He knows everything about cars. He will make sure that car is in tip top shape or your daughter when she's ready. I'm going to hook you up with him. And we have a special program for people that work with Bob. It's a little bit more, but you're going to have a concierge service. He's going to be your one-to-one service manager. Would you be interested in that? Hmm. Oh yeah, I'm interested in that, right? So this is what I'm talking about. It's kind of a fun, I love telling this story because it's Mm -hmm. (laughs) just an ongoing story that keeps giving to me. But it is so emblematic of the problem. No concept in these companies to think about me as a person. I'm just a number. Mm. I'm just, I'm just a quote to them. Can yeah. I give you a number? No um, multiple pathways thinking about the people, different people have different goals for their car, different outcomes they want. No connection to my personal goals or outcomes at all. All they were thinking about is them. How do I get more people in here? How do I churn people? How do I get more people for my used car lot? How do I churn people into a new car? Right? It's just, a, it's a game and it's so annoying and I'll leave it as soon as I can. If I found somebody else that did it, I would pay more for the car. I'd pay more for service to get that kind of attention. So I'm begging somebody to call me. I want to work on this. But the the point is, is your marketing doing the same thing? Do you really listen? Do you really create uh, value added services and content for me, from my perspective, from my goals? Or is it really about you satisfying your call queue or your marketing MQL number Mm -hmm. or your sales quota? Is that what it's about? And 
too many companies that's what it's about. And uh, again, that's my my car dealer story. And I, I I'm going to keep telling that one because, like I said, it's 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 still going. <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah, <laughs> love it. All right. Well, Todd, uh, somebody's been listening. Maybe that car dealership uh, owner, president, GM. How can they get a hold of you? Where should they go? What should they do? Well, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Just search Todd Hockenberry. I would love to connect with you. Let me know that you listen to the show. Uh, you can also come to our website, top-line-results.com. Love to talk to you there. And then uh, the book is Inbound Organization. Mm -hmm. There's a website for it at that URL. And uh, it's on Amazon and where you find books. And uh, we appreciate everybody's support on the book. Fantastic, Todd. Thanks for being here. Hope to have you back. My pleasure, Jason. Anytime. You bet.